This is the last video about section 3.3.2. And here we will discuss the theoretical lemma, which is found in the book in a bit more detail, because the proof of this lemma is a bit tricky. And I want to go through the proof step by step to explain it all. So let us look. I copy the statement here. So lemma, lemma 329 on page 92. This says, let G from R to R be monotonically increasing and U standard uniform. Then the covariance of G of U with G of 1 minus U is smaller or equal to 0. So that is the statement. And first that is useful. We have just used this in the video because really what we need, I wrote G from R to R. We could just as well write G from 0 to 1 to R since we are never plugging in any value which is not in the interval 0 to 1. So for g being x squared, this is what we just did in our R experiment. And in the book, if you read the comments around this lemma, you will see there are many more applications of that method. And I just want to run through the proof explicitly because the result is more tricky than it looks. If you look at that, it looks kind of trivial, but other similar statements are not exactly true. And related to this, the proof is surprisingly tricky. So when we go through the proof, you will see that proof is very much one of these proofs where it's easy enough to check every step, but where you have a hard time understanding how did anybody invent this proof. I took it from another book, so it is not my proof, but a clever person must have invented this proof. So let us just go through the steps. Proof. Again, we are in a proof, so our aim while we are in the proof is not to understand the big picture. We are just breaking down the statement into small steps. We are checking is every step correct. And the non-obvious thing happens straight away. Namely, we take another random variable which is not mentioned in the statement, which will only be used in the proof and will disappear in the end again. So let V be standard uniform, independent of U. So there are now two cases. U and V are both in the interval 0 to 1. And either U is smaller or U is larger. So case 1, U could be smaller than V. And case 2, U could be larger than V. And if u is smaller than v, g is monotonically increasing, then we know g of u is also smaller than g of v. And g of 1 minus u, since 1 minus u turns the order around, 1 minus u is bigger than 1 minus v. So g of 1 minus u is bigger than g of 1 minus v. So that is case 1. In case 2, the order is reversed. If u is bigger than v, then g of u is bigger or equal than g of v. And I need to add the equal sign here because I did not require g to be strictly monotonically increasing. So just monotonically increasing allows flat functions g or flat bits in g. So if u is strictly greater, we can only conclude that g of u is greater or equal. And similarly for 1 minus u, g of 1 minus u is less than or equal to g of 1 minus v. So we just need to see how, when we follow these steps, do we come out at the claim of the lemma. Both of these statements allow us to say one is bigger, one is smaller. So if we do g of u minus g of v times g of 1 minus u minus g of 1 minus v, then in both cases that is less than or equal to zero. Let's just check. In case 1, the first term is negative, g of u is smaller, so if I do g of u minus g of v, I get something negative. But the second term, g of 1 minus u, is bigger than g of 1 minus v, so g of 1 minus u minus g of 1 minus v is positive. So negative times positive is negative. In case 2, here we have big minus small. And here we have small minus big. So here the first term is positive, the second term is negative. The result is the same. The product of both of them is negative. So these cases, case 1 and case 2, it is random in which case we are, because it depends on u and v. But it doesn't matter in which case we are as far as the last line is concerned. This product is always negative, whatever case we are in. So that is not random, it's always negative. OK, so let's remember that. And I come back to this in a second. We just start a new slide. So what we really want to work out is the covariance of g of u with g of 1 minus u. That's the thing we want to show is negative. And the general formula is, or one of the general formulas for covariance is 
covariance of x and y is expectation of x, y minus expectation of x times expectation of y. That's one way to write the covariance. The other way is expectation of x minus mean of x times y minus mean of y. So both of these work. Here we are going to use the first one. So what we get is expectation of g of u, g of 1 minus u, minus expectation of g of u times the expectation of g of 1 minus u. And now these steps keep being surprising. The next step is where v, the artificial random variable we introduced, comes in. And for that we need to remember u and v have the same distribution. Let us draw quick, just go back. v is written here, is uniformly distributed on the interval 0, 0 to 1, that is the same as u is. So as far as the distribution is concerned, u and v are the same. Different random values, same distribution. That expectation with u we could instead write as an expectation with v no change. And same thing here, that expectation we could also write as expectation with v, and that we could also write as an expectation with v. We have this choice, u and v have the same distribution. The one thing we cannot do, let me just write that as a warning, this thing here is not equal to the expectation of g of u, g of 1 minus v, this we cannot do because here we have two independent random variables, whereas here we have twice the same random variable. So this, the blue expression and the red expression, these are different, even when the black expression and the blue expression are the same. So let's see what we have. I first write the expression and then we check it out. So I claim we can write this as one half expectation of g of u, g of 1 minus u plus expectation g of v, g of 1 minus v, minus expectation g of u, expectation g of 1 minus v, minus expectation g of v, expectation g of 1 minus u. And the reason I can do that is, I believe, clear from my coloring scheme. I have written that black term g of u, g of 1 minus u, and this blue term g of v, g of 1 minus v, but they are the same. If I add them and take one half, I have not done any damage. And same here, I need to subtract this term, and I have used the black and blue terms by mixing them up a bit. So here I have black times blue, that's the same as I have here. And here I have blue times black, that's also the same, so I subtract it twice, but say it's just one half, so we are all good. Now I've copied this to a new page. Let me see what we can do. So first thing what we can do is we can write all of that in one expectation. And that is easy enough for the first two terms. So here I get g of u, g of 1 minus u plus g of v, g of 1 minus v. And that is slightly trickier but still correct for the next terms. Namely here I do g of u, g of 1 minus v and minus g of v, g of 1 minus u. And why can I do that? Here I'm using a new rule from probability. Let me just write that here. Namely, it is if x and y are independent, then the expectation of a product equals the product of the expectations. So that's a rule which may look a bit surprising when you see it the first time. You can take multiplications out of expectation if the two random variables are independent. So if we use this rule, we know expectation g of u times expectation g of 1 minus v, like we have it here. This we can write as one expectation. So we can write expectation g of u times g of 1 minus v. This helps us with these two terms and these two terms. So we can write that as an expectation of a product, that as an expectation of the product, and then to get from here to here, the other step we need to do, that's one which is much easier, which we have seen often, we can take the plus this way into the expectation, or if we read it from here to here, we can take the plus outside the expectation. So that expectation is equal expectation of the first term plus expectation of the second term minus expectation of the third term minus expectation of the fourth term. So from here to here, the first step is take out plus minus minus, that is easy. 
And then the second step is apply the rule I wrote at the bottom and take the products apart. And we can only do that with the ones where we have a u and a v. We could not take these products apart because u and 1 minus u are definitely not independent. So we have checked another step. And again, the step is a bit non-obvious, but if we just check correctness, there is no problem. This expression equals that expression by the rules we just discussed. The next step is now easy enough. That equals 1 half, and now we just combine that into a multiplication of two brackets. Again, that step is best read backwards for checking. So I claim that equals g of u minus g of v times g of 1 minus u minus g of 1 minus v. And to check this, if we multiply that bracket with that bracket, we should get four terms in total. So one term is g of u and g of 1 minus u with a plus. That is this term. Then we have g of u and minus g of 1 minus v. So that's g of u, g of 1 minus v with a minus. That is that term. Then we have minus g of v times g of 1 minus u. So that is this term. And finally, minus g of v times minus g of 1 minus v has a plus again, and it's this term. So we are all got that expectation in the last row equals the expectation in the row before. And now it pays off what we did at the start. That multiplication of two brackets is this one. And so we know g of u minus g of v times g of 1 minus u minus g of 1 minus v is random, but whatever the random value may be, it's always negative. So that here is smaller or equal to zero. And the expectation of a negative quantity is negative, and one half a negative quantity is negative, so that is smaller or equal to zero. And let me draw a little box here that completes the proof. So again, that proof is very much of the kind we have to restrict ourselves to checking every step. But if we combine the steps, we have covariance g of u g of 1 minus u here is equal to that, 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 smaller or equal to zero. We checked our steps. So we know this covariance is negative and we have proved the theorem. And in particular, you see, we introduced this v for the proof. That was the bit which was most incomprehensible or most ingenious in terms of the person who invented it. And that v we used for the first time halfway through the proof, but it all cancelled out before the end. And what we proved is a statement which has no v in. Good. And that is one of the main theoretical tools. If you want to construct antithetic variable methods, often you start with u and 1 minus u as the basis of your antithetic pairs, and then you apply one or more functions. And the important thing is just in combination, they should be monotonically increasing, and then that lemma generally guarantees you that you are good as far as the result is concerned. And that concludes our discussion of section 3.3.2. Good, and that finishes our series of videos about section 3.3.2, about the antithetic variables method. And there is one more method for speeding up Monte Carlo estimates to come. And that we will discuss in the next video. Thank you all.